Read all about it. I'm your host, Stephanie Milan, and today we're here with children's book author Darlene Beck Jacobson. Darlene, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really pleased to be here. Great. Well, we're going to talk about your book, Wheels of Change, in just a little bit, but I want to uh, find out from you, when did you know that writing was your passion? Well, I think as soon as I was able to pick up a pen and form letters, I love to write. Part of the things that I did when I was young was when we used to have to learn how to write in cursive. I mm -hmm. think it's a dying art, but anyhow, <laughs> back then, we would do the letters, you know, practice day in and day out, and mm -hmm. I started connecting them into words and would write letters, trying to see if I could get responses. I would send a letter to the pop stars of the day, mm -hmm. asking for autographs. Often got a stamped autograph picture back, but it oh. still got me excited enough to say, oh, writing letters is pretty cool. Maybe yeah. that's a way that I can connect with other people. I kept a diary, like a lot of kids do when they're young, and just enjoyed reading a lot. So I would, and I had a, an active imagination in that I would imagine all different kinds of things and I guess create stories in my head. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I got older that I realized that, okay, this is actually a story kind of thing that I could write down and maybe make a short story or book out of. But as a kid, writing was just something that was interesting and that I enjoyed doing. That's great, that's wonderful. And I also had a very active imagination. I tell people all the time, I was out there in my backyard. I had my little caboodle, those 19, yeah. early 1990s exactly. caboodles. <laughs> and I was collecting these rocks and pretending they were these gems from a yeah. queen of Egypt, you know, just creating right. all these stories. Right. And it's just, you know, you know from a young age, and imagination and creativity is so important in children. And so how often do you write now? Um, I don't have a specific schedule in that uh, I try to get something done every day. Since I have a blog and I have, uh, I belong to a couple of group blogs, I do have a certain schedule where I have to provide material for those things on a regular basis, but in terms of writing for my books or for my short stories, I try to do at least a couple of hours a day. Right. It may be in the morning, it may be in the afternoon. I find my most productive times are during the day. As I get closer to night, not so much, so okay. I try to get most of that done during the day. And writing doesn't necessarily have to be um, on the computer. As a matter of fact, when I do a rough draft, I get my pen and pe pencil out, okay. pencil and paper, mm -hmm. because I like scribbling, I like scratching, and there's just something about holding the paper and, and erasing mistakes and, and just seeing the pages accumulate that is satisfying. For me. That's really nice. And uh, I was going to ask you that, too, because I know for myself, I love writing ideas down on paper, but I love writing on the computer. I don't know why. I don't know what it is. I mean, I think if I had been trained on a typewriter, maybe I would have been more inclined to do that, but for some reason I love doing it on the computer, and then other people are like, no, you know, I want to write on pen and paper. That is what, you know, makes me feel the most productive, and I feel like my thoughts flow, and so that's really great. And that, that's exactly what it is. My the creative, the creative part is, comes out on pencil and paper, and then once I have a draft, then I can go to the computer, because if I just have to stare at a computer screen, for some reason that creativity <laughs> goes out the window <laughs> with the mechanics that are involved. I'm still you know, learning all the ins and outs of you know, social media and how to you know, navigate the computer and all the things you can do with it, but um, it is satisfying to be able to create a draft from do scratch and then move on. Sorry, uh, do you um, have social media? Like, what social media I outlets do. do you do? It's important to, otherwise people aren't going to find me and they're not going to know that I'm out there. Well, in addition to running my, my blog and website, I have uh, Facebook and I, I, uh, Twitter and um, LinkedIn. So I try to, you know, post things and do regular um, visits to those sites so I can kind of get things um, moving and just have make people aware of what's going on. My I, I blog. I, put a new blog post up twice a week on okay. Mondays and Fridays with content. And the content is, it's not, I mean, there's plenty of blogs out there about writers and how to write. I decide not to do that okay. because there's so much information. I can't compete with all that. Um, my expertise and my background have been in teaching. So my um, blog is, is for um, children with um, learning dis disabilities or with learning challenges. And I try to do multi-sensory activities, recipes, crafts and things like that for them. Um, I interview children's book authors um, and anything that might spur curiosity. I have a, a person who regularly posts on nature. Okay. Um, beekeeping is, was one post for 
footprints of different animals and oh, identify wow. them. So I mean, wow. there's there's all kinds of things yeah. that I post on the blog that m kids might be interested in or that might want to learn about. Absolutely, so, and that's really fascinating. Do you want to tell our viewers what um, what that is called, that blog site, so that they can visit that because that would be oh, great sure. for um, you it's, know. Um, well, to life, but it's actually www.darlenebeckjacobson.wordpress.com. Okay, very great. Okay, let's move in a little bit more to the technical stuff, and then I want to shift into the workshops and things like that. Sure. Um, now, you are a traditional published author. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience with that? How did you find your agent? Um, what has your experience been? Did you go on book tours, things like that? I'd be happy to do that. Um, I learned early on if I was going to write for children, I would have to be connected with other people who were doing the same thing in order to grow as an author, in order to find connections. Because when you write, it's a solo pursuit. You're in your room, you're by yourself, there's no one there mm -hmm. to offer you anything. So I joined this, the Society for Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, which is a national organization based in California, but every state has their own chapter. Okay. So I belong to the New Jersey chapter. Um, every annual conference and this was maybe six or seven years I guess it was 2010 I went to the conference and we have all kinds of opportunities editors that you get to meet with you can have your manuscripts critiqued um, and they have what they call a pitch session where you just go out there and you just throw your work they'll say what do you write and you just have five minutes to tell them what your project is and I pitched Wheels of Change at the time. It was called, it had a different title, but I pitched it to an editor. I'm, and I'm, I'm sorry, I pitched it to an agent mm -hmm. who said, well, send me the first 30 pages, which is usually what they say if there's a bit of an interest. Okay. After mm -hmm. the conference, you send the first 30 pages. And I sent that to her, and I waited. And I waited. <laughs> and I waited. And I said, <laughs> Um, there's, a, there's a person who is, it runs our, our group, who's the um, regional director of, this, of the society, and I said, I, in an email, I said, it, what's the proper etiquette for getting back and finding out if there's still interest or if they've just passed on it? She said, well, how long has it been? I said, it's been three months. She said, well, you can send an email and ask her, you know, how. And I sent the email, and I waited, and I waited, <laughs> and I waited. Still no answer. So we're, we're like maybe four months into this, you know, having sent this pitch, in, or, mm -hmm. or having sent the manuscript 30 pages out. And I contacted my friend again, and she said, who is it? And I told her the agent's name. She said, I'll send her you know, a, a query to, just to see what's going on. She sent her a query, and the, the answer I got back was, we never got it. Oh. It turns out it ended up in their spam file, and she said, resubmit. So I resubmitted the 30 pages. Within a week, she said, I want to see the whole manuscript. And so I said, OK. And so I sent her the whole manuscript, and two weeks later, she offered me representation. Oh, wow. So the moral to that story for me is don't assume that just because you don't hear something that they, they're not, people aren't interested. Pursue and find out if, you know, for sure if it didn't end up in the spam folder somewhere, oh, yeah. you know, which was really... That's great. That's right. great. All right, we're going to take a short break, and when we get back, we're going to talk more about um, your traditional publishing, so stay tuned. For independent living for seniors age 62 and over, People Inc. offers safe, maintenance-free apartments across Western New York. The affordable rent is income-based. For more information, call People Inc. Senior Living at 817-9090. Looking for a cooking oil with a light flavor and reduced absorption so food preserves its natural flavor? One with a high smoke point for stir-frying, sautéing, grilling, and baking? Then choose all-natural Pompeian 100% grapeseed oil, imported from France. Grapes have been a key ingredient of the healthy Mediterranean diet for years. Pompeian 100% grapeseed oil is the chef's choice for high heat cooking, grilling, stir-frying, sautéing, or even deep frying. And Pompeian 100% grapeseed oil is great for baking, too, because its delicate taste does not overwhelm the flavor of cakes, cookies, and other favorite recipes. A key traditional ingredient of the Mediterranean, grapeseed oil is a rich source of vitamin E antioxidant and naturally gluten-free. Buy imported Pompeian 100% grapeseed oil today and find great recipes at Pompeian.com.
Wait, don't let this happen to you. At JanFence, we're family owned and operated for over 50 years. Providing to read a all about it, I'm your host, Stephanie Milan, and today we have children's book author, Darlene Beck Jacobson, who we're talking with. Uh, Darlene, again, thank you so much for joining us, and let's get back into the publishing. So we were talking before about traditional publishing you were saying of, of how you found your literary agent and that was great um, now have you been on any book tours I've been on a blog tour okay. which was a whole interesting um, concept by itself mm -hmm. I had previously um, had the privilege of seeing someone else run a blog tour and and provided a spot for their book and I thought hmm, maybe this is a way that I should go before my book comes out and I, I tailored it so that I was able to have some blog posts come out before the the, the official launch of the book and then during the launch and then afterwards. So it encompassed about two months of posts, uh, maybe two or three posts a week. Okay. And it would link, and, and the, the po each post would link to the previous one and then the one that was coming up so that people could go back and forth and kind of see different things um, that were posted about, about me, about the book. One was a poetry post. One was about historic, writing historical fiction. Some were just about the character development, things like that. Okay. And you were also, some of your pieces were published in, um, there was a piece published in Highlights, a piece published in Crickets, a piece published in Cicada. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yes, those were, were historical fiction pieces. They're not from the book itself, mm -hmm. but that was a, a way for me initially when I first decided I wanted to be published to get my um, name out there and to try see if, if I could do some short stories in the field of historical fiction and it was really a pleasure to be able to have you know the editors at Cricket and Cicada say yeah we like this piece and we want we want to put it in in the magazine mm -hmm. um, I thought perhaps maybe the pieces might end up being a, a book themselves as chapters or whatever but that book is still kind of sitting and getting cobwebs in the drawer <laughs> because it hasn't quite gone where I wanted it to go <laughs> which is it, which is a whole other story uh, well, that does happen sometimes. As an author, you know? I'm sure you're familiar <laughs> with that. I probably have about a hundred of those right. somewhere. Like Useful for doorstops <laughs> or for whatever, but not, they're not great. for yeah, a, they're a book. They're just sitting there. Right. Well, that's great. And then, um, hi, you know, highlights stuck out to me because I know you said it was just like a, what was it in highlights? Well, it, they're the magazines that everybody sees at the dentist's office, right? I mean, everybody knows I that magazine. I grew up on those magazines. Those were my favorite magazines as a kid. It's a perfect magazine for someone who wants to be published and really has no credit right away or has nothing that they can send out in the world saying, look what I've done, because it allows you to send in puzzles, games, mm -hmm. activities, ideas, and, the, and, and get a little byline. That's so great. I had puzzles and fillers, pieces and things like that in there. And it kind of helps you boost your confidence when you're first starting out as a writer and gives you something to, to credit when you're sending those queries out into editors in the world saying, I've had some things published in, mm -hmm. in, in a popular children's magazine. So that was a way to kind of get my foot in the door early on. Now, I want to segue into your book, Wheels of Change. Yes. Um, the, the premise behind it is so interesting, and I want you to tell everybody about that. And I also want to talk about the research that went into this. So why don't you tell everybody a little bit about what this book is? About? OK, um, Wheels of Change is a piece of historical fiction that I wrote um, it came about because I had two interesting facts when I was digging through my family tree. The first one was I found out that my great-grandfather, um, who lived in Washington, D.C. at the turn of the century, was a carriage maker. He made, carriage, he made a carriage for John Philip Sousa and other prominent people in the um, District of Columbia during the early 1900s, late 1800s. And the second bit of, of fact was that my, my grandmother, who was um, my great-grandfather's daughter, um, got an invitation to a reception held at the White House by Theodore Roosevelt. And I thought, huh, not, not everybody's ancestors or not everybody's um, relatives gets to meet a president, especially one as cool as T.R. Mm -hmm. So I said, this might be a good idea for a story. So I kind of put the two together and my what if was, what if a young girl whose papa owns a carriage barn and who she herself is non non-traditional little girl, she would like to be a blacksmith one day in a time when girls are supposed to know their proper role in society. What if at the dawn of the automobile her pop's business is threatened? Would she, what would she do to help him? Would she go all the way to the president for help? And that's how the story came about. Very nice. And I kind of um, wanted to tie in some historical context to broaden it and to make, give it more depth so um, it, it, the 
Washington DC at that time was a very rural place except for the area around the, the White House and it was also a segregated city. So I had Papa employ an um, African American blacksmith and uh, the neighbors are not pleased about this. And Emily is enamored with him. She just loves Henry and she will do anything, like I said, to be a blacksmith and she just loves hanging around at the forge and helping him in any way she can. And the other issue was um, women's suffrage because mm -hmm. it's the state, it's the nation's capital and women are demonstrating for the right to vote at a time when they are supposed to know their proper place and it's not acceptable. So Emily gets to witness all these kinds of things um, and all the changes that are taking place and hence the wheels have changed. There are personal changes, there are social changes and there's a, a lot of layer you know, to that. That's a really wonderful, wonderful book. It sounds great. The premise sounds great. Now, what kinds of research did you have to do, or how long did it take you to do your research on um, this book? There were, there were, there, um, for any traditional um, historical fiction piece, there are what they call um, primary and secondary sources. A lot of my primary sources, I actually visited a, a wonderful carriage museum called the Mifflinburg Buggy Museum in Pennsylvania. It um, is left, it, it, it has been intact since um, the previous owner or the person who owned it back in the 1930s closed the door one day and they reopened it 50 years later and everything was still there as it was wow. back then. So that was a, a wonderful resource. Mm -hmm. I've been in contact with the people there and they let me walk around and take pictures. So I got the feel for what it was like to have a carriage operation and what took place there. I did a lot of research um, with the Smithsonian and Washington DC historical societies and um, because the, the story takes place in Washington DC, the mm -hmm. White House Historical Association, every time I asked a question, someone was willing to answer, wow. which was wonderful. That's very nice. I also contacted Sagamore Hill, TR's um, home up in okay. um, Long Island, mm -hmm. and they provided me with pictures and photos that they had of carriages that TR owned. Mm -hmm. um, I contacted the Henry Ford Museum because there is a, a carriage that is described in the story that TR purchased and that he owned and they don't know for sure who the owner or the, the builder of the carriage is mm -hmm. and I used that as my model. They gave oh, me a wow. detailed description of everything that was in materials that were used, what it looked like and that was how I based my carriage um, description and how it, how it came together based on their information. So. Um, the most gratifying thing for me was that anytime I asked a question to anyone, they were, they were happy to share the information that they had. So that's really encouraging. It, research can nev will never be daunt as dauntless as it could be if you didn't have that help. Absolutely. You know, so Absolutely. And if people are willing to help you, it's great. And I know with my own novel, um, I did a lot of research. I know we had talked about this with it, British medical journals and things like that. And um, I loved, loved the research process. It was just, it was wonderful and it was phenomenal. We're going to take another short break and when we get back we're going to look at some old photographs as well as read a passage out of Wheels of Change, so stay tuned. The fencing. Why wait online at the big box store? Just call Jan Fence. Ask about our Easy Fence to Go products by Active Yards, the first truly do it yourself fence product. At Jan Fence, we always do what we say, come see us today. Step into an extraordinary world that will excite your senses. Experience our delectable Mughlai cuisine and the magic of tandoori savoir faire. Let our international award-winning team delight you with a taste of heaven. Enjoy our mouth-watering flavors and our unique flair for excellence. Savor the elegance of fine dining and catering. Chazan Restaurant. Indulge your taste buds. In a world where bankers have lost all interest, where robots and fat cats rule our fortunes, one woman Hi. will stand up and strive to do the impossible. Be treated like a person. Friends and neighbors will join her quest. Ordinary people will band together against the forces of corporate greed. And together they will form Philadelphia Federal Credit Union, already in a neighborhood near you. Imagine the finest hand-selected USDA prime steak you'll ever have. The freshest line-caught seafood. Our Wine Spectator award-winning wine list and soul-satisfying desserts. 
Bring that together with the perfect date, the winning business deal, a memorable family celebration. Welcome to Rod's Steak and Seafood Grill in nearby Morristown, New Jersey. Bring your appetite and feed your passion. Your credit score. Welcome back to Read All About It. I'm your host, Stephanie Milan, and we're here with author Darlene Beck Jacobson. Darlene, I want to read a review, um, a, a little blurb that's on the back of Wheels of Change. It says, a moving and quietly beautiful story whose simple surface hides deep lessons. And the person who wrote this was Kermit Roosevelt great-great-grandson of Theodore Roosevelt. Why don't you tell us about that? Because that's a pretty big, uh, you know, review to have on the back there. Well, I was pretty proud of that. Um, actually, when um, the book had gone through the final editing, my editor said, we need to get a few blurbs for the back of the book um, so that we can get advanced copies out for people to read. And so I said, all right, I'll look and see what I can do. And um, a couple of, of years before, I had happened to see an article in the Philadelphia Inquirer that Kermit Roosevelt had written a book of his own. He's an author um, of a historical um, piece about the law um, called the, um, the, the In the Shadow of the Law, which okay. was very good, and I had read the book. And I cut out the piece of paper and just kind of tucked it away. So I was looking through my notes. I came across, and I realized he's a, prof a law professor at the University of Pennsylvania. So I went on the website, and there was a, an email address, and I sent, um, gave a little bit about my history with my, um, my grandmother have, having met his great-grandfather, and I asked him if he would do a blurb, if he'd be happy to read the book and do a blurb if he liked it, and he said he'd be happy to, to send, for me to send it to him, which I did, and he wrote that wonderful um, blurb, which was so yeah. exciting. That's incredible. Yeah. Right, <laughs> and um, it came full circle, which w the part that, that really excites me was when the book came out, I wanted to thank him and give him a, co a signed copy. He invited me to his office in Philadelphia, and I got to get my picture taken with the great-grandson of Theodore Roosevelt, which was, how cool is that? Yeah. You know, so, I mean, that I, I have that picture in the book there, oh, which is great. fun. So, um, yeah, the, the, the great-granddaughter of the carriage maker uh, or, or the granddaughter of my grandmother, who met T.R., got to meet <laughs> his, his great-grandson. So that was right. He's a wonderful guy, very, oh, very great. amiable, very generous and kind. I mean, it was, it was a lovely meeting. Oh, so. that is just great. That now, let's go into some of the other photos that you have here, because you have a lot of historical photos, and mm -hmm. I'd like to go through, and we could show them to the camera. So go ahead. I do. Um, well, this was, uh, I would mention that Mifflinburg Museum, this was uh, one of the carriages they had there, and I kind of used that as inspiration throughout the story to get an idea of what I, I wanted children to um, focus on when we were talking about the age of carriages. And if you notice, the first automobile looks pretty much like a carriage. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, absolutely. And kids are fascinated by that. They wonder, you know, why it looks the way it does. This was the original invitation that my grandmother received to the reception where she met Theodore Roosevelt. And I have pictures of my grandmother as a young woman and my grandfather. That's great. And then do you have a picture also in the book of, as well of your grandmother. Of my grandmother, I do, at the that. time that she would have met T.R. Right. Um, obviously, she was older. She was 18 at the time, but I wanted to make her younger, make her 12, so that it would fit in with the theme of middle grade students that reading is about the story. Um, yeah, so that was, that was really fun to be able to include the pictures. In, in the story. Yes, absolutely. So do you want to read us a passage out of I this? I would book? love to. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm, <laughs> gonna, I'm gonna be reading from the just from the beginning, chapter okay. one. Wonderful. Kind of sets the scene and lets us know about the main character, Emily. Okay. Henry's hammer hits iron. Ping, pa ping. Its music feels warm against my chest like a wool sweater. A blacksmith is a magician. To bend iron like clay and then make it hard again is the best trick. Is this carriage really for John Philip Sousa, the composer of those peppy marching tunes, I ask Henry? One and the same, Miss Emily. Mr. Sousa must want the best carriage he can find, I say. Henry chuckles. He'll get that sure enough. Papa is owner of the Soper Carriage Works and makes the fanciest, fanciest most expensive carriages in Washington, D.C. I keep an eye out for him, since if he saw me, he would send me home, saying the barn is no place for a young lady. The truth is, it's the perfect place for me. I dance across the sawdust-covered floor past Sam, Papa's woodworker. His saw hums like a busy beehive, slicing through planks of wood. I pick up handfuls of the slivers, inhaling their fresh-cut fragrance. 
The slivers stick to my sweaty palms. I wipe my hands on my dress to shake them off. The slivers stick there as well, like they found a home. Mama would frown at my soot and sawdust gown. I glide back to the forge, breathing in the sweet wood and varnish smells. And then, le then I lean on a car wooden carriage wheel propped up next to Henry's work area. Even in this soot-covered space, things are neat and tidy. Papa rents the land, but owns the building and all the equipment inside. Except Henry has his own box of tools that he keeps at the forge. When I ask him why he doesn't use Papa's tools, Henry says, I've been using these familiar ones so long now, they feel like part of my hand. Pulsing waves of heat make it feel like summer year-round. The fire needs to burn red hot to be the right temperature for bending iron. I stare into the fire's belly, watching it move and change colors as if it were a living thing. Some folks might think the forge is dark and dreary with only one small window. But the fire is like a beacon that lights up the whole barn and makes it shimmer. Papa's barn without the forge would be like Mama's house without the kitchen. The heart would be gone. The rhythmic tapping of Henry's hammer is music to me. If I had one wish, here it is, to be a blacksmith. Wow, sounds great. So where Thank can you. everyone get this book? Well, you can get this on Amazon, obviously. They always have books listed there. And you can also get it through Creston Books, which is the publisher um, out in Berkeley, California, and PGW, which is the book distributor. Okay. Um, those are all the places that it's available. Barnes & Noble also carries the book. Okay. Have you ever thought um, of seeing this go to a movie? It's funny you should ask that. When my um, agent first um, took it on, she was so excited about it. She did send it out to... Um, for movie consideration, she, she thought um, envisioned it as probably an after-school special kind kind of thing, mm -hmm. American Girl audience um, tie-in. Um, I haven't heard anything about that. So. Of course, if HBO gets a hold of it, it'll well, be a very right. different story. Well, <laughs> well, that's true, and who knows what. Um, but, I, but I am really excited and pleased. It has recently won recognition as a notable social studies trade book oh, wonderful. by the um, Children's Book Council and the National Society for Social Studies. So it's going to be getting um, recognition in schools, which oh, is my right. ultimate goal and dream to have um, children in various schools throughout the country being able to access it and read it and I have curriculum guides and all the study questions core content to, for teachers to make it easy for them to use it in the classroom. Oh great and, and tell us a little bit about your workshops before we shift into you know what you're working on next type stuff so what you do workshops for children writing I workshops, do. correct? Right and um, before I had the book published my, my, my workshops were, would be focused on reading other people's books and um, talking about the um, with, with young children, picture books especially. Now that I have the book, um, I've done several workshops on writing fiction in general, and especially people seem to be interested in, in the process of writing the historical fiction. Okay. And mm -hmm. um, they, they like me to tie it in for students and how you can mine your own family's history to come up with a story and an idea. And we kind of brainstorm about things that, you know, th perhaps their grandparents might have done when they were young that people no longer do, mm. or occupations they might have had. Like, for, for instance, you don't see very many carriage makers nowadays. Correct. So mm. those kinds of things are the catalyst for a, we a, should bring a new back. idea. <laughs> new bring back. And telephone operators, yeah. they, they've gone the way of the... Uh -huh. yeah. Oh, like wow. And it, you think about, if you fast forward you know, 30 or 40 years, it those types of jobs are going to be obsolete. Well, that that's we right. can't imagine right no, now that they would You're be, right. but it's, it's amazing. And so it, I think yeah. it's interesting, and I think it's important for kids to um, write down a few of those things yeah, and to, to learn about their history. A lot of the kids seem to be interested um, and after they hear um, the workshop they they want to go ask their grandparents mm -hmm. questions that they didn't think about before, yeah, which is interesting great. and that's that's fun. And I would encourage you know parents and, and all you know children to take pictures and actually print them it, because see, they're so valuable later. I mean definitely you know if you find a picture from 50 you know you're not going to find it on the internet you know. No you won't. It's not, and if it's I, and if I lost, hadn't so. looked through old archives and the pictures this story might never have come to be because right. you like you say you, if the people involved in the story are, aren't here anymore mm -hmm. who's going to tell it. Exactly. So you have to have some kind of archive or some, something written down and photos are a great way to start. Absolutely. And some of the workshops I'll have the children bring in photos from the past and that's how we get conversations and how we get ideas started by looking at the photos. Okay, well why don't you tell us what your website is again? Okay, it's um, www.darlenebeckjacobson.com. 
Okay, so you can get this book, you know where to get it, you know what her uh, website is, and as a last bit, what, have you have anything else that's coming out soon? Well, um, I have a picture book that is currently making the rounds. It's historical fiction, and it's, um, the character is a little known woman from the past who was um, very um, prominent in the women's suffrage movement, but nobody's ever heard of her. Okay. So hopefully um, the book about Matilda Jocelyn Gage and her childhood will be um, coming out sometime. Sounds I'm, great. I'm hopeful. <laughs> wonderful. Sounds wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us on Read All About It, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Yours and an experienced credit expert, we want to help you really use it. With access to helpful experienced experts over the phone and online, we can help you use it to get a better idea of what info the banks have on you. Use it to get more choice of mortgages. Use it to make your money go further. Take the next step to improving your financial future with your free 30-day trial at experian.co.uk. Freppy's Tex-Mex, you can definitely taste the freshness in our food. You should definitely come to Freppy's because it's a great place. You can bring your family, very kid friendly. All my servers are amazing, friendly people. Everyone here is just happy to serve and, and I think it shows. The thing that sets us apart is the quality and freshness of our food. And I think once you try it, you'd be coming back. I'm Joe Desario, co-owner of Freppy's Tex-Mex in Plainfield, New Jersey.